would like to start by introducing myself and then uh, get back to why this is not going to be an ordinary speech, uh, why it probably won't be an ordinary workshop either. Um, I just retell what I'm going to say as, uh, as a story uh, connected to a uh, presentation of myself. Um, I used to be uh, vice chairman of, of FMSF, an organization mentioned earlier uh, in connection with uh, the uh, discussion that we had during Christian's speech. Um, I uh, left FMSF for uh, at least one year and uh, have returned just a couple of weeks ago as executive director for that. In the meantime, before I went back, uh, I used to work for uh, a Swedish consultant company called Ecofin, Ecofin LTD. Um, starting out by uh, advising uh, businessmen and especially business organization in Sweden on political issues. We were ghostwriting for, for, for anyone uh, who has worked with uh, ordin ordinary, not libertarian business people. Uh, I think that you all know how very necessary it is that they have the right advices before they start writing debating articles and things like that. Uh, I was working for this company uh, during 89, during the changes in Eastern Europe. And then I also got in contact with Tom G. Palmer from the Institute of Humane Studies in, uh, in Virginia. Um, Tom Palmer had moved to Vienna at that time, uh, working in a joint venture together with the Karl Menger Institute uh, called the East-West Outreach Program. Uh, Tom and I was on the phone and we discussed uh, one of the major problems he had when talking to people in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe uh, about what was next, what was after communism. Because uh, there was a tendency at that time to turn to a middle of the road alternative, so-called third way, or the Swedish model. Sweden was regarded as, uh, as an example among these people, among, and in these countries. Uh, Tom suggested to me then that uh, some of us in Sweden, some of the Swedish libertarians, should write a collection of essays on why the Swedish model uh, was not a model for Eastern Europe. And I thought that was a good idea, so I said to Tom, uh, we'll, we'll discuss this and I'll get back to you. Two hours later, uh, our senior consultant, our security director at the consultancy company, came back from a business meeting he had had with the Association of Free Enterprise in Sweden, saying that uh, I had a meeting with his client, and his client suggested to me that we should write something about the Swedish model and why the Swedish model is not a model for Eastern Europe. We should uh, issue something that should be a warning from Sweden. I called Tom back and told him that we already got a client for this, so uh, we're working on it. Uh, the result was this book called The Rise and Decline of the Swedish Welfare State. Uh, it was uh, written by a very good friend of mine, uh, a very good libertarian. Uh, his name is Sven Otto Litterin. And it was translated uh, by another very good friend of mine into what, uh, according to Henrik Baker, most of you call almost English. It was the first uh, issue we made, the rise and decline of the Swedish welfare state in English. There is a Swedish copy too, but the, but the Swedish version of this is actually worse than the English one. Um, this was originally intended uh, for, for Swedish purposes. Uh, we never thought that we, uh, the small consultant company and the Association of Free Enterprise in Sweden, actually would create very much in Eastern Europe. It was not the purpose of setting up either our organization or the Association of Free Enterprise. Uh, we thought that it would gain some media attention in Sweden and uh, the Social Democrats uh, at least would not be happy about it, which is a good thing in itself. Uh, what happened was that uh, it actually gained some attention also abroad. Uh, I spoke with Tom. Uh, a while after this was published, and uh, he told me that he had gotten a lot of contacts in other countries uh, who were uh, immediately interested in this warning from Sweden. Uh, one year ago, or almost one year ago, uh, on the day after the one-year jubilee 
of the uh, Czechoslovakian Revolution, we had the honor to present the Czech translation in Prague, uh, which is made by Lenka Kalisova at the very newly set up Liberal Institute of F.A. Hayek in Prague, uh, intermediated by IHS. Um, this week, this very week, uh, I intended to go to Budapest uh, and stayed here instead uh, to make a presentation of the Hungarian translation made by Giza Laszlo, who is a professor or his assistant professor at the Budapest School of Economics. Uh, the 1st of May, which is some sort of socialist holiday, this year I had honor to be in Romania, in Sinaya, outside Bucharest, uh, to, together with Maria Valiano, who is uh, also lecturer, I believe, at the Bucharest School of Economics, uh, except for working with a lot of other things as well, uh, being the Romanian uh, representative of our consultant company, uh, we presented the Romanian translation together at an IHS event. Um, Boris Pinsker, who is working for uh, the Post Factum publishing house in Moscow, uh, undertook to make a Russian translation. Um, this one was printed in 10,000 copies. Boris Pinsker uh, didn't print that many, uh, uh, considering Russian circumstances. He printed 30,000 copies in Russian, actually much, neatly, much more neatly printed than this one. Some weeks after uh, the Russian translation was there, we received a letter from another Russian guy who had all by himself, without our permission, made a translation, translation of his own, asking for our permission to print it. In Bulgaria, parts of it have been published in, uh, in papers issued by the Democratic Party. I don't know yet, but it might be a Bulgarian translation ready. In France, we have a translation. Uh, looking for a publishing house. In South Africa, Leon Lowe um, told me that uh, obviously the third way the Swedish model uh, was the official left-wing position one year ago, exactly the same as it was in Eastern Europe. Uh, he also got a couple of copies. Uh, luckily, we didn't have to translate it in South Africa, but it might be that it's going to be a copy in Africa, and we haven't decided that yet. Uh, there was a success. Um, the main message of this book uh, is not something I'm going to bring up to you now because um, we had a speech this morning by Otto Brahms Pedersen on the very same issue. We're going to have another one tomorrow morning by John Henry Holmberg. So there's no need for me to speak on the same issue once again. And so the basic message <laughs> of this book um, which is 90% uh, libertarian, but not 100% libertarian, I would say, um, is that with a couple of hundred years of capitalism, or at least 100 years of some capitalism, uh, you can afford some years or some decades of socialism. That is actually what we did in Sweden. Sweden was a fairly libertarian country in the 19th century. Um, after uh, the big debate during the last uh, decades of the 19th century, we received a fairly libertarian society. This stayed on uh, until the, the 20th century, when uh, the ideas of the middle of the road policies, when the ideas of the Swedish model actually emerged. That we stayed out of two world wars gave us some prosperity left, and the problem was that this prosperity uh, was used by uh, the experimenters of the 40s and especially the 50s. That is actually what the Swedish model is all about. And we say we have, we've got two basic reasons for the situation today, where you all know what the Swedish model is about today. It's no drinking alcohol and it's very high taxes. Uh, that is, the first one is uh, utopian. Uh, I would like to quote to you what was uh, very common uh, among those who actually built this model. Uh, it's Alva Myrdal and Gunnar Myrdal, actually Nobel laureates, uh, both of them who wrote uh, a book called Crisis in the Population Question. 
Taking care of infants is the most laborious, impersonal and technically most demanding stage of child raising. It is therefore highly suitable for being taken care of by experts, saying the government. This was uh, a very common opinion among those who built the Swedish welfare state at that time. It's not anymore. And the reason that the Swedish model has stayed on for so long, and the reason it uh, it turned into what we've got today, with very high tax pressure and everything. It's not actually the utopians of the 30s and the 40s. It is uh, pure public choice. That is, that uh, all this prosperity in the hands of the government uh, gave, gave an opportunity for the interest groups to try to uh, build out the welfare state in their own areas, which also happened. Uh, one of, one, one of the Swedish experts on the Swedish model, uh, Nils Carlsson, uh, who is a um, PhD student, I, should, I think we should call him, in Uppsala, said that the Swedish welfare state is actually um, a result of uh, unintended, it's an unintended consequence, probably, because no one would have been so stupid as to, uh, as, as to think it out in the first place. <laughs> So, uh, my main problem working with this book now and still trying to find a publishing house in France and other places is that I don't know if uh, the third way is still the official left-wing position. If it still is interesting for the countries in Eastern and Central Europe. Um, I mean, it would, be, it would be very convenient to say that it used to be two years ago that we published this book, it's not anymore. Uh, I don't think it is that way. And my second question in this is, if it still is, what should we do about it? Is publishing a book like this a good thing to do? Or is it something else we should do to try to avoid the problem of falling into the same trap as Sweden has fallen into? What should we do both in countries in, in Eastern and Central Europe and countries like South Africa, where this problem is obviously still existing. That's all I had to say, and now it's your turn for discussion. Thank you very much. I'm going to move down here now, okay? Fine. I still got many more copies left in Sweden, so and anyone who hasn't re yet read it and would like a copy, please give me a business card or write down your name or something and I'll send you one, okay? Tom. Yes, Einar. Would you, would you like to discuss uh, if there was one particular policy that was introduced in Sweden um, that was very damaging, could you discuss what that policy is, what the uh, arguments in favor of that policy were, and some alternative or more libertarian solutions to the problems that are being uh, supposedly solved by that policy? That's a pretty one. I mean, the worst problem in Swedish society is, uh, is tax pressure and tax ratio. Uh, I think we all can agree on that. And I mean, the reason for raising taxes, we all know, that's um, financing uh, governmental activities. Uh, I mean, we all know about the mechanisms uh, raising taxes. Uh, if I'm supposed to pick one specific example, I would say it's the housing policy. Which is very, very obvious um, that governmental policies has failed. And the reason behind the Swedish housing policy was actually, uh, from the beginning, uh, war laws. During the war, um, special laws, of course, were introduced, and then they remained after the war. Um, it's very, ob it's very easy to isolate an issue like that and say, this is obviously very, very wrong and it's possible to make isolated changes in this special area. I would, I would select the housing policy, yes. 
Well, what, what were the arguments used in favor of the housing policy after the war? I don't use this. I mean, uh, everyone should have an apartment. Now, one of the main arguments for uh, remaining in the uh, uh, housing policy of the war was that it seemed to work during the war. Uh, that's why they, sitting to defend what they could get from, from the, uh, the people they represent. But how, how to change the system? Is the solution a big crisis? Or uh, is the solution to just to try to, to attack, to isolate problems and to, to tackle the uh, uh, one after the other? I actually don't know. I mean, uh when I'm pessimistic, I think it's the first uh, solution. When I'm optimistic, I think it's the, uh, it's the second solution. Um, I think that a realistic perspective for, 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 for the uh, 10 years to come is that um, the countries of Eastern Europe will be much better off than Sweden. Because uh, there we've got uh, some sort of unity uh, around what direction to take. In Sweden, a lot of people te still tend to think that it's working, and it's not. So I think that uh, maybe in 10 years or so, Sweden will be the most socialistic country in Europe. Um, well, right then, maybe people will start to realize what has actually happened and, and what to do about it. On the other hand, I would like to say uh, the same thing as I did in discussion with Christian earlier today, that uh, the minds of people actually have changed, <clears throat> and they have changed in Czechoslovakia, they have changed in the United States and in Sweden. So uh, everyone is actually advocating liberty today. The problem with Sweden is uh, the implementation in real politics. I don't know if this, uh, one could say the same thing about the other Scandinavian uh, countries. I mean, Sweden is the worst one. Yep. Uh, I saw a television program from Sweden yesterday, or two days ago, was about uh, the election in Sweden. Uh, it was uh, the chairman of this new party in Sweden who was interviewed. And um, the journalist asked uh, this chairman of the new party, but uh, uh, is it possible for you to give any examples of, um, of any countries who have reduced their taxes as much as you suggested that uh, we should be doing it in Sweden? And, and he couldn't uh, give any examples. So uh, the journalists seemed uh, as they were not convinced that it would be possible at all. But do you think that it, by any chance it would be possible to convince the Swedish people that it would be possible to re reduce or remove or eliminate the Swedish model at all? I don't know. I think that. Uh the membership of Sweden in the EEC is actually something that is uh, going to give a, give a good result. I fully understand the Bruges group uh, because uh, relatively uh, EEC seems to be socialistic from a British point of view. In Sweden, the EEC um, would mean at least 15% lower in tax pressure and a lot of liberal reforms like that because we are much worse off than a general country in the EEC. And joining the EEC means, at least in people's minds, uh, to some extent abandoning the Swedish model too. Uh, I think that is, a, that is a very important step. Um, in the long run, I don't know. Uh, I'm, 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 yes, sir. Uh, in, 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 in the... Pardon? <laughs> right. Now, European socialism is much better than Swedish socialism, relatively. Why? <laughs> because it, uh, it's not as socialistic, from our point of view. But I mean, uh, a lot of people who, uh, who built the Swedish welfare state, who actually were involved in this, believe that uh, Sweden were 
some of the, the, the chosen country. Let me give you another quote from, 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 from the Middles in crisis, crisis in the Population Question. As a result of historical coincidence, the Scandinavian countries, especially Sweden, offer the best imaginable preconditions for an audacious experiment in democratic socialism. Why do they believe that? I don't know. I mean, it, w Sweden was actually the chosen country for this experiment, just as was uh, Soviet Russia for communism. Was that uh, that sort of thinking uh, that lay behind what actually happened in Sweden? But you told us that uh, the Soviet Union was the Swedish society was more or less libertarian in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just wondering, I don't understand, what made it change Sweden to a uh, Swedish model it is nowadays? What was the reason why uh, the libertarian model, let's say, didn't uh, go on? Change towards what it is nowadays? Um, basically, two reasons I would say, and I think that probably called Fredrik and Fredrik uh, m m might add something. Um, so the first reason was that uh, after the two world wars, as I told you, we, um, we, we had a lot of uh, wealth uh, preserved as we didn't participate in these wars. Normally, we say that. Uh, a war uh, creates more governmental intervention. In Sweden, I would say, it was uh, on the contrary, um, it was a lot of money left for the politicians to use. It was very uh, easy to start experimenting. Uh, the reason that this really changed over the, over the long run was that we had one single party uh, remaining in power for over 40 years, uh, namely the Social Democrats. Um, if you change the political majority every third or uh, every six years, uh, it's very hard to, uh, to to build up something that remains. In Sweden, we we, we didn't have that problem. We had uh, basically a one-party system for 40 years, and 40 years is a very long time to uh, to build your own sort of system. I would say that is one of the reasons. I don't know if um, uh, you've got other reasons to add. Well, the, the change or for why why the society so called left the libertarianism is it was in line with the international development, I think. It mm -hmm. changes in all over the world. Uh, okay, we were more, more extreme in Sweden, but it was always in line with the changes all over the world. Yes, um, I have three related questions. Um, firstly, what percentage of your economy is in the government sector? Secondly, is that still growing? And did it through the eighties? And thirdly, do Swedish socialists um, claim that it should grow more, and that the problems to the that the solution to the perceived problems is more state intervention? We're talking about state intervention. Uh, the Swedish model uh, is actually a system of. Uh, letting capitalism work uh, in one in one area, we have got very much of big government and uh, and, and and big big business going together in Sweden, um, and that has stayed on. And I I don't think that the social democrats or even the communists think it would be a very uh, clever idea to socialize big business. What we have got though is uh, a growing. Um, share of governmental owning in the companies. In the last 10 years, uh, the governmental share of the total stock market value has uh, increased from 3% to 10% is the value today. And we have got very, very bad plans on the governmental table today, and especially endorsed by the uh, Blue Collar uh, Union to, uh, to, to extend this further. Um, so uh, the the obvious share is not that large. Uh, the Social Democrats would like to, uh, to to extend it. That's my answer to your question. You had a second question in between these two. Yeah, yeah has it been growing through the 80s? Yes, it has. Yes, yes, it has. The 80s is actually when it has been growing. And, and that's 
they would say, say that the solution to the housing problem was more taxes, more spending on public housing? Right. I mean, the problem today is uh, you've got almost no private savings at all in Sweden. Uh, the government's uh, solution to this is uh, make it even harder uh, to save privately and, uh, and, and increase the governmental saving. That's, that's socialism. Anyone else? If not, thank you very much for your attention, and we move on to the dollar workshop. Is about.